But tonight, I'm not going to be giving a full sermon like I will tomorrow morning. But I do want to share a little about why Christians are so passionate about choosing life. We are often misunderstood in the world. I read an article titled, The Hypocrisy of the Pro-Life Movement. And they put pro-life in quotation marks, right? Because... The author was trying to show how pro-life people are actually anti-life on many issues. And you could tell that it was written by someone who didn't really understand the Christian perspective or have a biblical worldview, which is fine, because I've gotten used to that. We all need to get used to that, because Christians are often misunderstood and misrepresented in this world. And what they did was they tried to lump together abortion with many other issues that are much more nuanced and complex, not to mention the fact that many people lump Christians together with all the self-professed pro-life politicians out there and everything that they vote for or against. And I can tell you that many politicians don't really care about life the way that we do or have, a, and very few have a biblical worldview. So if you're looking to them for a proper understanding of the Christian perspective, then you're going to be left lacking. Nonetheless, tomorrow morning, I will go into more detail about what Scripture says and why Christians stand up for the lives of preborn children. And the three main points in that message will be, God is the author and giver of life. God condemns taking... Oh, got a thing going on. God condemns taking innocent life. And I'll just let you do it. And so I won't, I won't touch this. <laughs> uh, and God determines the value of life. And I will show clear biblical evidence for all three of those truths. Tonight, however, I want to look at a short passage that I won't be using tomorrow. And it's in Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 34. And if you have your Bibles with you, feel free to follow along. But uh, we, we do plan to have the scripture on the screens as well. Luke 1, starting in verse 39. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill what he has spoken to her. Notice how this passage identified John. Still in the womb, right? As what? A baby. Verse 41 said the baby leaped in her womb. Now, so then then you have to, well, should you really call it a baby or would fetus be the more appropriate term? And in God's eyes, there is no distinction. In the womb or outside the womb, same person, same value, same worth. Not only that, but verse 44 says the baby John leaped for joy at the sound of Mary's voice. And why would he do that? Well, it wasn't really because of Mary. It was because she was the mother of Christ, the Savior of the world. And tomorrow we're going to dig into more scriptures that teach the person in a womb is no less a person. But we see that truth right here in this passage as well. John was still in the womb, but reacted to Mary's presence Because not only was he already a person, but God was already working in his life. You see, John wasn't going to become a person once he moved locations from inside the womb to outside the womb. He already was. And God wasn't waiting for him to be born before using him. You see, John, God had designated John to be a prophet. And you could call this his first prophecy, The commentator Kent Hughes said, John the Baptist's ministry was beginning three months before his birth. Additionally, John leaped because he was overcome with joy. And Hughes said, I'm ready for that quote now. Do not miss the point. This fetus, yet to see the light of the world, experienced the emotion of joyous delight. 
This is incontrovertible testimony to the pre-birth personhood of John the Baptist. You see, John was about six months old at this point. And I have a picture of what a baby is like at six months in the womb. He would have likely been between 7 and 12 inches long and weighed between 1 to 2 pounds. He had fully formed lungs and his own unique fingerprints. And if that were not enough, we see that John was already an emotional being, right? He was filled with joy. What makes it even more amazing is when you realize what he was filled with joy about. You see, Jesus, though he, the, he is eternal, and we're going to look at that in a minute, but as far as his human existence goes, he was far less developed than John at this point. He would have only been what they call a zygote. Mary was three or four days pregnant, yet when that zygote entered the room, baby John, still in a womb of his own, could not help but express his excitement. Now, you know, if Mary had gone to a Planned Parenthood that day instead, she would have been a perfect candidate for an abortion. We're talking about a girl that's 12 to 14 years old, most likely, unmarried, the beginning stages of her pregnancy, not that they would care. But if she had gotten an abortion, what would she have killed? The potential of a human being or the Messiah? And what about Elizabeth? Would she have killed the potential of a prophet or John the Baptist? Thankfully, that didn't happen with either of those children. Both of those men were given life and their lives changed the world. John would come to prepare the way for Christ who would come to save humanity. You see, Jesus wasn't just any person. He was both human and divine. And... His human life had a beginning point, but his life is eternal. As we see in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus' life never really began because He is the eternal Creator. But He did humble Himself and take the form of a man to show us his love through his sinless, miraculous, sinless birth and his sinless life and then allowing himself to be sacrificed on a cross for our sins. You see, it was the punishment that we deserved. But he gives new life to those who will repent and choose to follow him in faith. You see, our first birth is so important but it's not as important as our second birth. Jesus told a guy named Nicodemus that he must be born again. Well, Nick was confused. He was like, that doesn't make any sense. I've gained a little weight since then. How am I going to go back into my mother's womb? And he was right. That sounds crazy. That is crazy. But what's not crazy is dying to your sins and being born spiritually. 
which is what Jesus offers. It's an amazing gift, and it is why we celebrate Christmas. It's a gift that's been bought and paid for, but remains completely useless to you unless you unwrap it with faith in Christ. By believing that he is who he says he is, that he did what he said he did, that he lived that sinless life, that he died on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for your sins. And not only that, but he was raised three days later to prove that death could not hold him. His death is enough to pay everyone's debt, but it is only effective for you if you will repent and follow him. Just believing will not save you. Just saying a prayer will not save you. Just going to church will not save you. Just being what everybody calls a good person will not save you. All the good works that Christians are called to do and to grow in are the fruit of a real relationship with Jesus Christ, not the root. The root is a genuine relationship from repenting and making Jesus your Savior and the master of your life. And the fruit grows out of that relationship, out of that root. You see, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said that, which means he was either a liar, a lunatic, or your only hope. And he made it abundantly clear that the only way to be known by him was to repent and to make him the Lord of your life. C.S. Lewis said this, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true of infinite importance, the only thing it cannot be is moderately important. And he was right. And I hope that you will see what Christmas is really all about and why thousands of years later, over 2,000 years later, we still stand here today to celebrate the birth of the Savior of the world. Let me pray. God, thank you for this time together. And I pray that this message would hit wherever it needs to hit and whomever it needs to hit. And we thank you so much. You did not have to do what you did for us. You did it because you love us. What an amazing love that is. God, we thank you for the value and the worth that you give each one of us. It is amazing. And I'm thankful that I don't get my worth from the world, but that my value comes from my creator and my identity comes from my relationship with Christ. And I pray that anyone here tonight who doesn't have that's not where they get their value and that's not where their identity lies. That they would make a choice to change that tonight. We pray that our worship would be uh, an offering to you, Lord. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.